Thank you. It's so good to be here, and I appreciate this opportunity to give this presentation. I'd like to invite us to uh, begin with a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to come together as your children to today. We ask that you enlighten our intellect and enrich our souls with the knowledge of your truth. Help us to learn about the miracles, how you have worked through the economy of salvation, and how that can help us to better understand you, the mysteries of your Son, and so that we can be led into eternal life. We ask with the intercession of Blessed Mary, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, good morning again, and uh, I'd like to introduce the, today's topic as Miracles of the Bible from Aaron's Rod to the Resurrection. I remind you that recently in one of these presentations that we had here at the cathedral, that our rector, Father Peter Mangum, reminded us that the Catholic Church embraces both faith and reason. He quoted St. John Paul II in his encyclical document, Fides et Ratio, Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of the truth, and God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth. Well, in some cases, like our recent conference on the Shroud of Turin, we appropriate scientific study and empirical evidence, things that are help us to, uh, to know and to learn, things that are comprehensible to our intellect and to our rational soul. But in other cases, like the study of miracles, there is no scientific explanation and there is no empirical evidence. And in these cases, nonetheless, we still believe that the miraculous is true and important and relevant to our very faith. Today, as we go through this presentation, I'm going to be relying on information from sacred scripture, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, from the Church Fathers and the Popes, from various magisterial documents, and also from some interviews I conducted with Dr. Brant Petrie and Dr. Greg Ball at Notre Dame Seminary. So at the end, I'll make a bi bibliography of sources and resources available in case you want to do further reading on this topic. Okay, I know that you all have covered in previous uh, lectures in this series the notion of the created and ordered universe. So this is a, basically a review. God formed the earth and made it. He did not create it a chaos, but to be formed and lived in. As creator of all things, God gave everything a given nature. And so this is a philosophical term that we use to say a nature makes a thing what it is. Uh, things have tendencies and operations and faculties that are unique to their nature and different from other natures. In other words, in other words the world is intelligible. We can comprehend it. We can have expectations about what's going to happen based on our experience in the past. So for example, a dog barks and a cat meows and a dog's never gonna meow and a cat's never going to bark and we can understand that. We know things by their, the way they act and their natural tendencies. But what happens when things, when ordered things go beyond their natural order? We know that a staff or shepherd's crook is made out of wood. It's milled and it's solid and it's rigid. It's no longer living. So why then are we surprised if it blooms or if it buds and produces almonds? We know that water is pure hydrogen and oxygen. It's clear and it's pure. But are we surprised then if it suddenly changes into something of a different color or a different fragrance and aroma, a different flavor, and even something with alcohol content? And we know also that a person, if they are sick, they take on, they become subject to various symptoms signs of their disease. Are we surprised if they're suddenly healed and cured without the intervention of a doctor or without even medicine? So now if you're scratching your head and you're thinking about miracles in a slightly more philosophical way, then we're really on the right track for the beginning of this presentation. We define natural as something that exists in the universe, something that was created by God and exists, not made by humankind. Now, Supernatural is that which exceeds or transcends the natural created order. It's the transcending of the operations, faculties, and end of a given creature. So 
This is important because it suggests to us that things that are supernatural suggest divine intervention from God. And this is important to us as Christians because we know if God is willing and able and actually does intervene in our nature, then he loves us and he cares about us in a very intimate way. So intimate that he wants to be involved in the smallest details of our lives. I just want to add that sacred scripture uses various terms to describe these realities, the miraculous, signs, wonders, great terror, and other terms. So as we go through this, you'll hear me use those terms and also a couple of liter literary devices, and I'll just breeze through those next. The Old Testament versus New Testament miracles. I don't know if you've ever wondered at this, but is there a difference? Do they operate differently? And what are some of the characteristics of each? Uh, well, I will say that there's no sweeping generalizations of the miracles of the Old Testament versus the New. They're not characterized in different ways. And in fact, the ancient church fathers made no distinction between the two. But in many ways, it can be said that miracles of the Old Testament anticipate the miracles of the New Testament. And in fact, they, they happened to serve as an example to teach, and they were written down to instruct us. You might say that the principal purpose on which the plan of the Old Covenant, that which is written in the Old Testament, has three purposes. To prepare for the coming of Christ, to prophesy and announce his coming, and to prefigure and indicate its meaning through various types. So what is a type then? Typology is a literary device that I'll be using throughout today's uh, presentation. It's the study of persons, places, or events, or institutions in the Bible that foreshadow and point to something that happens later of a greater reality. This is the way of, the, you might have heard that term, divine pedagogy. This is God's, God's way of revealing his careful plan, but slow and easy so that we can understand throughout the course of salvation history. Typology helps us see a meaning that objectively exists. And there's no need, believe me, to convince a Catholic that miracles are true. We see them and we believe in them. The second device is prefiguration. And this just means a foreshadowing. It's something that happens, especially in the case of Israel, to prepare them for something that will go beyond the things that happened in the Old Testament. Uh, prefiguration is something that happens to the... Israelites in a way that helps them really know and understand what it means to be the people of God, the chosen ones. The next two slides are basically for some interest for you. Scholars of scripture have taken an opportunity to try and identify the miracles by type. And you can see how many different, uh, I'll use this screen here, how many different types there are. Healing and nature, provision such as feeding and giving uh, Alms, judgment, exorcism, and casting out demons, affliction, healing the sick, communication, and resurrection of the dead. The most, the three I highlighted at the top suggest the most common miracles in the whole Bible are about healing, nature, and provision. This next slide also is a similar uh, chart. It shows that the miracles by the books of the Bible. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it's really hard to identify what's miraculous and what's not in the sacred scripture. It's all uh, the divinely inspired activity. But you can see that in terms of documentation, in the Old Testament, Exodus, this is the book that talks about the Red Sea narrative and the leading of the people, the ten plagues, uh, the leading of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land through the wilderness. But also in the New Testament, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts of the Apostles. So let's start with the, uh, the, the, uh, the miracles of the Old Testament. When, we, when they told me this topic, I, I said, well, Aaron's rod. There's actually two different miracles associated with Aaron's rod or staff. And so I'm going to talk about both. We probably first should talk about who Aaron is anyway. Aaron is the older brother of Moses. Aaron was chosen by God to be Israel's first high priest. He and his sons, the priests, uh, ministered to the people of Israel throughout the, uh, their time in the uh, wilderness, and they maintained the tabernacle. Aaron's rod, or staff, 
was his symbol of authority. And just as though a shepherd uses a crook to lead and to tend the sheep, this rod of Aaron in some ways is a prefiguration of Jesus in his title that we use, Jesus the Good Shepherd. On one occasion, Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent in speech. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue, perhaps suggesting that he had a type of speech impediment. And so therefore God appointed Aaron to serve as his spokesman before the Pharaoh of Egypt and before the people of Israel. The context of this miracle is that the Lord commands Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh who had enslaved the people of Israel in Egypt. Tell him to free the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, but Pharaoh's heart was so hardened that he refused. God promised to stretch out his hand against Egypt with mighty acts of judgment, which is something that he later did. These are the ten plagues. And here is the miracle from the Exodus chapter 6. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh demands of you produce a sign or wonder, you will say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will turn into a serpent. Then Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it turned into a serpent. Pharaoh in turn summoned the wise men and his sorcerers. Each one threw down his staff, and they also turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed all of their staffs. Pharaoh, however, still remained hardened of heart and would not listen. This is an artistic depiction because cameras, of course, unfortunately, weren't available then to record the actual scene. The significance of this is that Aaron's staff is a sign of the Lord's power over nature. You may have seen in movies, Pharaoh is often depicted with a, a, a cobra image on his headpiece, and a cobra represented a serpent goddess, a false god. And so in a way, allegorically, the staff also symbolizes a prefiguration of the sign of the cross. It overcomes evil, it was used to divide the sea, and it swallows the enemy. Aaron's rod number two. This is an occasion in which Aaron's rod actually blossoms. The context is that some of the Israelites, during their travels through the desert wilderness, began to revolt against Aaron. The Lord tells Moses to go to the Israelites and secure one staff from each of the 12 leaders of the ancestral houses, 12 staffs in all. God instructs Moses to write each leader's name onto his staff and write Aaron's name onto the staff of the uh, Levites. Place them all in the tent of meeting. It would be locked overnight. And the staff of the man whom the Lord would choose would sprout. The miracle happens in Numbers chapter 17. When Moses, 17 verses 16 through 28. When Moses entered the tent of the covenant, Aaron's staff representing the house of Levi had sprouted. It put forth sprouts, produced blossoms, and bore ripe almonds. Amazing. So Moses brought all the staffs to the Lord's presence in the Israelites. Each one identified his own staff and took it. The Lord's staff, the Lord said to Moses, put Aaron's staff in front of the covenant for safekeeping as a sign to the rebellious. Now the significance is important here. You might have heard this before, but Aaron's Moses, Aaron and Moses were to be God's designated leaders of the Israelite people. The staff blossomed to indicate the real and preeminent priests were actually those of the Aaron, the tribe of Aaron. Now, the staff and or rod didn't blossom because of anything Aaron did. The staff blossomed because of God's gracious mercy. And in some ways, that's a prefiguration of the gratuitous gift that God gives to us, our salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. This is also a very other, uh, another interesting prefiguration because you might have seen in our various churches throughout the diocese that lots of times St. Joseph is pictured with a staff that's blooming. The husband of Mary, according to our tradition, would be chosen by God and revealed through a sign. Joseph the carpenter's staff blossomed, as Aaron had done many centuries earlier, while the other suitors of Mary's, their staffs did not. 
amazing. So pay attention to the, st uh, the statues that you see of St. Joseph's and notice that you might see that in the future. There is also an allegorical interpretation here in that as almonds, which is what bloomed on Aaron's staff, they they're comprised of three parts. There's a bitter outer covering, a hard shell, but inside there's nourishment. So too is the knowledge of God through the scriptures. The parting of the Red Sea, what a great story. The context is that the Israelites had been captive in Egypt for 400 years, or 430, depending on how you count the term. God unleashed 10 great plagues upon Egypt, and finally, Pharaoh capitulated and agreed to let them go. And so they start their trek to the good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey, which God had promised to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exodus is a Greek term which means road out, and in the Bible it means deliverance at sea. And so in this picture, Charlton Heston, I mean Moses, <laughs> leads, the people, <coughs> leads the people through the Red Sea. But Yul Brynner, <coughs> I mean Pharaoh, <laughs> reconsiders and sends the great army of people to recapture the Israelites. The miracle comes from Exodus chapter 13 and 14. God says to Moses, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and split it in two that the Israelites may pass through the sea on dry land. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they go in after them. And so Moses stretched out his hand, and the Lord drove back the sea and turned the sea into dry ground with the water as a wall to their right and left. The Egyptians followed in pursuit, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen, and the Lord spoke, Stretch out your hand so that the water may flow back upon the Egyptians." At daybreak, the, sur the sea returned to its normal flow. The Egyptians were fleeing head on toward it when the Lord cast the Egyptians into the midst of the sea, and the water flowed back. Of all Pharaoh's army, not one escaped, but the Israelites walked dry shod in the midst of the sea. Now, the significance of this is this is one of the most important narratives in all of the Old Testament, and in fact, in all of sacred scripture. It's a focal point of the religious history of the people of Israel and a quintessential tale of, of liberation and deliverance. There are many applications and lessons to be learned here, but I would say the most important is that God is a faithful guide and a fulfiller of his covenant. He said to the Israelites, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Now to us Catholics, we consider this a primary prefiguration of the sacrament of Baptism. St. Paul applies in 2 Corinthians, those who passed through entered into the covenant of Moses, the covenant of Moses, and those who are baptized enter into the covenant of Jesus Christ. Allegorically, the sea, the Red Sea, is a type for baptism. It's just, it caused the end of Pharaoh and it washes away the devil's tyranny. And you might know that in the rite of baptism for an infant or for an adult, there is a minor, exor minor exorcism that washes away the devil's tyranny. Okay, you've all heard this next story. This is a good one. This is the story of manna from heaven in Exodus chapter 16. The context occurs while wandering in the desert on the way to the promised land, remember, 40 years, the people begin to complain to Moses. They long for their days, if you can imagine, in Egypt, where they had kettles of meat to eat and their fill of bread. But you have led us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of famine. And so the Lord says to Moses in Exodus chapter 16, I am going to rain down bread from heaven for you. Each day the people are to go out and gather their daily portion. Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning your fill of bread... In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew all about the camp. And when it evaporated, fine flakes were left on the surface of the, of the wilderness, like hoarfrost on the ground. The Israelites asked each other, what is this? And Moses said, it is the bread the Lord gave you to eat. Now, this is very significant to us as Catholics 
The Lord provided to the Israelites a daily ration, and he told them not to, not to hoard or collect more than they needed for the day. While the supply was abundant, no one ever went hungry. Where did you think you might have heard something like this before in one of your prayers? Perhaps in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Manna is known in sacred scripture as the bread of heaven and the bread of the angels. It's a prefiguration of Jesus who later himself said, I am the bread of life. I was just in New Orleans this week. We had the, uh, the funeral services for Mr. Tom Benson. So we've been in the cathedral there. And it reminded me, up, up, up above on their high altar, they have in Latin, Ece panis angelorum. This is the bread of life. And I love that because it reminds me of what we're talking about today. And it's also one of my favorite features of their, their beautiful cathedral. The burning bush. Who remembers this one from the movies when we were younger? The context of this miracle occurred when Moses had reached the age of 80 years old. Having lived as an exile in Midian for 40 years, one day he was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, and leading the flock beyond the wilderness, he came to the mountain of God called the Mount of Horeb. The miracle occurs in Exodus chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him as fire flaming out of a bush. When he looked, although the bush was on fire, it was not being consumed. So Moses decided, I must turn aside to look at this remarkable sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. He answered, here I am. God said, do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I am the God of your father, he continued, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The significance of this miracle is great. To Christian Jews, to Christians and Jews, this is the manifestation of God himself to his created children. And the location is important too because later on the same mountain, the Lord will promulgate the law. Also here, Elijah will come back to meet God. So I'd like to introduce the term to you, theophany. You may have heard this before. It means, basically means in the sacred scriptures an occurrence or occasion when God actually appears to man. Church fathers say that whenever God appears in the Old Testament, whenever God appears in the Old Testament, it's actually the Son, Jesus Christ. The Father does not reveal himself except through the Son and the Holy Spirit, as we say every Sunday in the Nicene Creed, the double prof profession of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Other theophanies you might be familiar with would be the time when, um, uh, when Jesus is being baptized by John in the Jordan, and we hear the voice, Behold, this is my beloved Son, upon whom my favor rests. That's an occasion of a theophany when God actually appears, at least in vocal form there, to the people and they can hear and experience his reality of his presence. Before we move on, we're getting ready to move into the miracles of the New Testament, but I wanted to take this opportunity to ask about the Ark of the Covenant. We all saw that movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. But does anybody remember the contents of the Ark? Does anybody remember what would have been inside? All right. The Ten Commandments, there were actually a few things. The Ten Commandments, the tablets, the second batch, the ones that weren't broken. Yeah. And the rod of Aaron and some manna, which had been rained down from heaven. Very interesting. Okay, and now we enter a transition period, and that is the miracles of the New Testament. I had the great blessing of being able to take a pilgrimage with my classmates to Jerusalem in the Holy Land uh, this past January. And so during the time we were there, they said, oh, it's going to be life-changing because you will be in the sites where you actually experience the places 
where these great miracles in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament occurred. And so I'm going to try to incorporate a couple of the photographs that I took during my pilgrimage to help try and bring some of these places and events uh, to life. And so, the wedding at Cana. This is Jesus' first miracle of his public ministry. The context is, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his, his disciples were also invited to the wedding. The miracle is in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, is where it's narrated. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jars of water there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. <coughs> Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine without knowing where it came from, although the servers who drew the water out had become wine, knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely the inferior one, but you have kept the good wine until now. We've all heard that story so many times, and it's just as beautiful every time. This is an artistic depiction of, of the miracle as it happened. But the significance is great. This is the first of Jesus' public <coughs> miracles of ministry. Why do you suppose Jesus would choose a wedding to institute his first miracles? That tells, tells you something very specific, that Jesus valued the institution of matrimony. It's an initial revelation of his glory by which the disciples began to believe in him. It's also a prefiguration of the resurrection because Jesus manifests his glory on the third day in Cana just as he reveals his glory by raising to life on the third day after his death. Also, this is a prefiguration, as I mentioned, of the sacrament of matrimony. We Catholics believe that Jesus sanctifies the covenant of marriage by his presence at the wedding in Cana. Um, I know that Monsignor Earl Provenza likes to say, well, in his marriage preparation, he always likes to say, now, this isn't just a marriage between the husband and the wife. This is a union, husband, wife, and God is a party to this marriage as well. Now, I do want to draw your attention to one in interesting uh, sentence that Jesus uses as this miracle is being narrated. Woman, how does your concern affect me? It might sound odd to our modern ears that a son would call his mother a woman, but <laughs> no matter what my mother would say if I called her that. <laughs> but it actually was a, a title of respect and endearment at that time, and so it was a, a really good thing that Jesus called her that. Lastly, I would comment that this was a prefiguration of the sacrament of the Eucharist because the transforming of water into wine points to the transubstantiation of wine into the blood of Christ when Jesus gave himself to us in the first Eucharistic liturgy. And lastly, I would say that because, God, because Jesus chose to make water into wine, and wine is something we enjoy, that, is, illustrates, that this illustrates Christ's desire to make men happy. This is a classmate of mine, Deacon Nick Adam from the Diocese of Jackson. This is in Cana at the church, at the site, and he's standing next to a water jar, which is believed to be one of the types of water jars that were actually used at the wedding of Cana. And so it's not what you would really expect. In my mind, I kind of imagine sort of a decorative, a decorative cistern, but this is uh, encased in glass, one that you can actually go up and take a look at. 20 to 30 gallons, you can imagine they had to be quite large. Now we have miracles of physical and spiritual healing. In the first chart that I put up at the beginning of the slide presentation, I tried to highlight that there are different types of miracles. And the miracles of healing can be divided into two different kinds. Miracles of spiritual healing, such as the forgiveness of sins, 
and the, of course the type that we most often think of, miracles of healing, physical healing, making the blind man see, making the lame man walk, and so forth. So there are so many examples of healing in the Bible, and I know that we're limited in time, but just to mention a few, there are so many examples. Peter's mother-in-law was healed, many who were sick, the man with leprosy, the centurion's servant, the man with the withered hand, the blind man, and the hemorrhaging woman, and so many more. I'm choosing to focus today on the healing of the paralytic because it has uh, dynamics of both physical and spiritual healing. The context is that a sense of resistance was beginning to grow against Jesus. And it would ultimately, from this point forward in this miracle, it would begin to build where the scribes and the Pharisees were beginning to seek a charge to bring against Jesus. Ultimately, that would lead to his, his death. And so the scribes charge him with blasphemy for his claiming to absolve sins. The miracle occurs here in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm using Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 18. People brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Courage, child, your sins are forgiven. At that, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, Why do you harbor evil thoughts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your stretcher, and go home. This is so significant, because it, types, it points to a type of paralysis deeper than just the physical. The type of paralysis that Jesus most wants to heal is to cure us from our sins. In fact, he started with that in this example of this miracle. In sacred scripture, you might remember from, especially in the Old Testament, sickness is sometimes seen as a, um, something that's as a punishment for sin or sinful behavior. <laughs> we see examples like, of that in Deuteronomy and the book of Chronicles. But sometimes righteous people suffer from sickness as well. Here, Jesus sees in the paralyzed man more than just the physical malady. He sees that spiritual paralysis also. We never would have thought of that when we saw a homeless man or a, a person who was uh, injured or, in this case, paralyzed, that there might be many maladies there that go beyond just the physical. And so when Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. This is meant to demonstrate that Jesus does have the authority to forgive sins. And as we know, only God can forgive sins. And so for us Catholics, we see this as a prefiguration of two things, the sacrament of anointing of the sick and the sacrament of reconciliation, which has a formula of absolution at the end. Okay. There was a region in the area near Galilee in northern Israel called Tabka. And this is where the site of many miracles occurred. So we had the calling of the first apostles, the Sermon on the Mount, healing of the leper, multiplication of the loaves, Jesus walks on the water, and meeting with Peter and his companions after the resurrection, and Jesus' last appearance in Galilee. So some of these next miracles we're going to talk about occurred in this very region. This is me and my classmates this past January on our pilgrimage to the Holy Land. That's me, fourth from the left. Beautiful sunny day, and uh, we were so blessed to be able to be there where, that, where these great miracles occurred. This picture shows near the Sea of Galilee a monastery and in the foreground, you can see water cistern on the left and on the right. This would be, does anybody know what that might have been used for? Grist mill. A grist mill. Very good. It's actually similar to a grist mill in that they would load the olives into there and roll that heavy stone around them like a grist mill would and just crush the olives to get out the delicious oil that was used for so many things in ancient Israel, from healing and anointing to cuisine. 
So that was a very special uh, occasion for us to get a chance to see some of the things that were not only places of antiquity, but the types of things that were used in antiquity. This next miracle that I'd like to talk about is the transfiguration of Jesus. This is narrated in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. The context is that Jesus takes his very inner, innermost circle of friends, Peter, James, and John. These were among the first disciples he called, also in this location, Tabitha. And he takes them to pray on a high mountain. Now, mountains were the usual sites where miracles were associated revelations and theophanies, uh, appearances of God. And in this case, they go up to Mount Tabor. Jesus singles these three out again when he invites them to pray later in the Garden of Gethsemane. The miracle occurs. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them conversing with him. Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. And from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Rise and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. Can you imagine? This event is of great significance because it confirms Jesus in his divine sonship. It also strengthens Peter, James, and John, who will later be very influential in the formation of the new church in its very earliest days. With his transfiguration, Jesus unveils his glory. There are many parallels between this event and, and Moses earlier, uh, God's self-revelation to Moses earlier in, on Mount Sinai. And so again, this is called a theophany. So why would Moses and Elijah both appear here with Jesus? I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but why those? There were so many great saints of the Old Testament. And the answer really is that both Moses as lawgiver and Elijah, the prophet, were well-known miracle workers. They fasted for 40 days, just as Jesus had. They were rejected, just as Jesus had been. And they encountered God's glory on Mount Sinai. Though they, though they all appear here, God's words, my son, distinguishes Jesus from them, who are, not, who are merely his servants, Moses and Elijah. Sometimes when people ask us, well, what's it going to be like in heaven? We say, well, we, well, we have our body. We talk about the resurrection. And the answer is we will have, we know from sacred scripture, we will have a glorified body. We don't know exactly what that means, but we can look to a couple of examples in sacred scripture. One is the way Jesus appeared to his disciples. They were locked in the upper room for fear of the Jews, and Jesus <coughs> came through the door. So we know that our glorified bodies are able to pass through physical space, even through walls. But we also know that Jesus sat with them and ate with them, and that doubting Thomas put his hands in the finger holes in his hands and in his side. So we know that there is a certain physicality too. I, I mention that here because we point to the transfiguration as a possible example of what our glorified bodies might look like. It's fun to speculate, but we won't know for sure until we get there. This is a picture of me praying at the site of the top of this mountain, the mountain of the transfiguration, and that is the very highest point on the mountain and it's believed that that possibly was the place where Jesus' transfiguration happened. And I was praying for the people of the Diocese of Shreveport at all the holy sites. So be assured that your prayer, that you have been prayed for. This next miracle that I'd like to talk about is a fun one. This is the multiplication of the loaves, sometimes called the feeding of the 5,000. Perhaps it's different from another event in sacred scripture, the feeding of the 4,000, but we'll do our best to make it through. 
the, uh, it's important to note that this particular miracle is narrated both in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of what were called the synoptic gospels. Okay, the context of this miracle occurs during Jesus' ministry in the region of Galilee. He went up in the mountain and he sat down with his disciples and the Jewish feast of Passover was near. The miracle occurs as narrated in John. I'm sorry, it's also in, all, in the book of John. John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what good are these for so many? Jesus said, have the people recline. So the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had their fill, he said to the disciples, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled the 12 wicker baskets with fragments. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Would have loved to have been there. Can you imagine how it would have tasted? <laughs> Something special about this fish. <laughs> well, it's, a great, it's of great significance. The miracle is the only miracle of all that are narrated in all the four Gospels, as I mentioned. Scholars um, speculate about the way this miracle physically happened. You've got a basket here with some loaves and fish, and you're handing it out. You keep reaching into this basket and giving more, and it's, it's like this basket never runs dry. And it is fun to speculate on sort of the physicality. How did that actually happen? Well, scholars speculate that the bread was multiplied when passing from the hands of Jesus, or most probably in the hands of the apostles. Very interesting. Now, what about all those fragments? Why did they bother? Can you imagine all the fish bones? But they were still able to have so much left over. Scholars believe that the gathering of fragments was an act of reverence to the gift of God. The gift of bread that Christ gave that day through his apostles continues in the life of the church even now and until the end of the world. Keep in mind that Jesus used all those ex I am examples and one that sticks in my mind when I read this is, I am the bread of life. Okay, we reach the point of the, the resurrection, the penultimate miracle in the New Testament. The context is, after Jesus' crucifixion and death on Friday, his body was taken down, wrapped in a linen cloth, and laid in a rock-hewn tomb in which no one yet had been buried. We believe that was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, as narrated as we've, hear, we've been hearing these on the past series of Fridays for the Stations of the Cross. The miracle as recounted in Luke chapter 24 is, at daybreak on the first day of the week, they took the spices that they had been prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Two men in dazzling garments appeared to them and said, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but has been raised. Well, the significance of this is clear. Jesus Christ's resurrection completes the work of redemption. This is what we talk about when we talk about the Paschal Mysteries, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and glorification of Jesus. Jesus is not in the tomb. He is the resurrection and the life, another one of his I am statements. And so without the resurrection, there would be no need to celebrate Christ. He would just have been another prophet. And for this reason, we say that... Um, we can say that the Easter liturgy is the high point of all our liturgies in the liturgical year, even more important than Christmas. Because it's the resurrection and the ascension into heaven that distinguishes Jesus as the one who has the power to conquer death, the true Son of God.
Okay, we're wrapping up a little early. I think I talked too fast. <laughs> but I have been uh, noting the constraints of our time. I think this is one of those topics where you could literally spend, I had a whole class on the Synoptic Gospels, and I think we had four lectures on the Transfiguration. <laughs> But as it said in John chapter 21, verse 25, there are so many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose the world itself could not contain all the books that would be written. So I'd like to speak just in general terms about the nature of miracles and how the church responds to those. Just because the miracles are not technically, dogmatically defined and dogmatically defined means expressed by the church as irrefutably and incontrovertibly true. Just because they're not dogmatically defined doesn't give us permission to interpret them however we wish, or even to cast doubt on their occurrence. For example, some skeptics might say, well, the manna on the, on the earth that fell down after the morning dew fall, it was just goo, some kind of a goo that landed on the ground and the so happened to be nourishing to the people of Israel. To say something like that would undermine our understanding of the prefiguration of the sacrament of the Eucharist. And so the stakes are very high. As Catholics, we don't have a problem with miracles. We profess them in our creed. Many of the statements of our creed are greatly miraculous. So for example, we believe in all that is seen and unseen. We started this presentation by talking about the natural and the supernatural and how the natural has scientific, uh, verifiable truths and, and, and uh, empirical evidence, but that the supernatural doesn't have necessarily in, empirical evidence to con corroborate, but it is nonetheless true and important to our faith. We also profess in our creed, he was born of the Virgin Mary. So the virgin birth, that's pretty miraculous, I would say. And so uh, we're, we're certainly a, 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 a people who believe in that which is miraculous. And the other example from the creed that I'd point out is we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life to, of the world to come. Again, quite miraculous. Well, I know that some of you will be going to the Mass shortly, so I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to extend my thanks for your gracious welcoming. Uh, this has been a real pleasure for me. I've been writing this for several weeks, here and there, just a little. Um, as I mentioned, there is a bibliography. Um, if you're interested, send me your email address through the parish office. The main sources that I used for this presentation were the Bible, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But I have a complete list of sources, I think 14 or 16 places where I was trying to draw information to make this as interesting as I, as I could. Um, but I... I, I I can make those available um, to you soon. Just one comment uh, at the end about the uh, historical fact. Uh, when you get home and have you had a chance to think about some of these things, and I encourage you to pray about some of these miracles and say, God, show me where you were working miracles in my life and um, help me to be open-minded to your works of, of various sorts in my life. I would encourage you to ask yourself these sets of questions about the relation between biblical word and historical fact. Did this really happen? Was it a wall of water or was it just a parting of the water? Was it dry shod land or was it kind of muddy as across the Red Sea? All those questions about historicity. Um, but I encourage you as you're doing that to tread carefully because it is a little perilous to make generalizations. The Bible speaks to us in ways that I've said are useful for teaching and correcting and, and rebuking and so forth and to educate us. We can say that confident, confidently that the miracles of the New Testament probably were recorded within the first hundred years after they were written. The miracles of the Old Testament, um, at least in parts, they were written long after they happened and th they came to be written through a more complex system of oral and written tradition. So the endeavor is a little speculative to say, did this really happen in the way that it was written in the Bible? Did it happen at all? Is this figurative wording or is it literal wording? How is it meant to be interpreted? Um, it's certainly not wise to pit historical and theology, uh, historical theology and, and, excuse me, the study of history and the study of theology against one another. Uh, what really did happen, we know, is that God <coughs> divinely revealed to us and his revelation 
God makes divine revelation to us, and his revelation comes through the way the events are given in the world. So we shouldn't, on the one hand, suppose that sacred scripture is like raw video. That's exactly the way it happened and exactly the time frame that it's given. But it is a literary presentation of events deeper than on the surface level. Bishop Robert Barron does a great job about explaining what the Bible is. He says it's not a book so much as it's a library. There's a section on the myth mythological uh, origins of the universe, and there's a section on the law, the Torah, and there's a section on history, Kings and Chronicles. There's a section on the Gospels. There's a section on poetry, Song of Psalms, and the Psalms. And then there's a section on apocryphal, uh, 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 revelatory, uh, not apocryphal, but a, re a revelatory section like the book of Daniel and the book of, of, uh, of Revelation. And so we can say that the miracles are recorded, that, um, that these are events that help us to learn, to know more about God, to deepen and enrich our faith, and to come to knowledge of uh, God through his son, Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you to, to keep praying with these miracles and the things that we talked about today, and hopefully this uh, will enrich you in ways that you haven't yet come to know. Let's